I found Tenet to be the film of last year or what 2020. I, th yeah. I felt that Tenet was, uh, was so underrated. Um, I think people should go back and really study that film because there are moments that are just jaw dropping. <laughs> Hello, I'm Sean Baker, and I'm delighted to be here at JM Video in Paris to talk about some of the titles that mean a lot to me. So let's start with Breaking the Waves. Um, Lars von Trier has had a major influence on me. All of his films I, I consider incredible. Um, now, I believe this was the first one I saw of his, though. This was my introduction to Lars von Trier. I went with a, uh, a girlfriend that I was dating at the time, and I guess this wasn't her thing, but that made me realize that she wasn't my thing. <laughs> and uh, I remember being in the theater and saying to, saying to myself, oh, this is special. It looks beautiful, it's speaking to me. And her and her friends kept on getting up and leaving for cigarette breaks every 15 minutes. And I realized in that moment that I was going to break up with her. So I'm very happy that I saw this film because uh, she wasn't right for me. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I love this film on many levels. It's also gorgeously shot. What he was doing technically uh, at the time, this is almost, uh, what, 25 years ago, uh, transferring the 35 millimeter, the Rob, Robbie Muller's uh, beautiful 35 millimeter out to video and then back again. It's something that I've actually practiced uh, um, the Florida Project, doing a film out. It all comes from him. And of course, you know, his subject matter is incredible, which leads me to uh, my favorite Dogma 95 film, The Idiots. Um, I find this to be an incredibly profound film, extremely funny as well. No, not many people talk about how this is like his funniest film. <laughs> It's really hard to find, actually. In the States, it's extremely hard to find. I'm hoping that this gets a proper restoration soon, because it needs it. It needs it. And it's, it's uh, definitely an underseen film. I continue to be a humongous uh, Von Trier fan, and I even consider you know, his, his last one to be you know, an incredible movie, very underrated. like a Peruvian movies that would as a... First off, I love Benedetta. I absolutely, it's one of my favorite films of, of last year. What was special about um, being at Cannes, being, I mean, for me, it was an absolute dream come true to be in Cannes main competition with uh, Red Rocket. But it was also incredibly surreal because I was in competition with these two guys. And these two guys had a direct influence on Red Rocket. Like the way that Paul Verhoeven uh, approaches sexuality yeah. and, and, and sex in general. And in his early films, uh, Turkish Delight, Spetters, uh, those films had a direct influence on Re the way that I approached uh, mm. sex in Red Rocket. Now, Bruno Dumont, um, I remember seeing Life of Jesus. Uh, v de Jesus. <laughs> I remember seeing that in the theater and just in falling in love with the way that he captured his landscapes and then working with non-professionals. And I could feel the presence of, of the director in a good way, uh, guiding the non-professionals. And every film since then has spoken to me. Yeah. Okay. Um, we let's can see. go up there because there are... Sure. Oh, I'm, just looking, I'm just looking to see if there's any other... Uh, I haven't seen this yet, and I love her. Oh, and I, this has been difficult to find in the U.S. Oh, yeah? I think I may have to purchase a Blu-ray before leaving. 
And by the way, I'm also, just, just to mention, a big advocate of physical media. I think that uh, video stores, there's something about the video store that feels wonderful where you're able to, it's like a bookstore. You get to browse, not just on the internet clicking through, you know, uh, what's available on Netflix. This is like, you, you, you can pick it up. And there's something about the physical nature of, 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 uh, of this medium that I love. I never worked in a video store. I applied for one. I got, I got rejected. <laughs> but I did work at a movie theater. Yeah, I was a projectionist manager at a theater when I was in my late teens. And did you know why we were rejected by the video club? I was too, too honest in my resume. I said I did drugs. So. <laughs> I was pretty stupid. I was a 17-year-old. In Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you know, um, you, you see the, uh, the dome it, uh, in one shot when it's turning to dusk and all yep. the, the neons are going on. You see the, uh, the Arclight Cinema, yep. which is now temporarily closed because of COVID, and we're hoping that it opens back up. This is like one of uh, LA's wonderful landmarks. It's a beautiful theater. With this, with the, it's known for the dome. I think you guys would mm -hmm. recognize it. And uh, that's where I discovered uh, Susanna Sun from Red Rocket. We were going to see a movie and we saw her in the lobby and she made such an impression on us that uh, we had to say hi and exchanged information and that's why she's in Red Rocket. And so Mad Max 2, in the States, we I know this as The Road Warrior. I didn't really even realize for a few years that it was a sequel mm. when I was young. I saw this, uh, this came out in what, 83, 82. So I probably, I saw this on VHS when I was probably around 12, 13, and such an impact on me, such a major impact on me. Now, I consider this the best of all of them. I mean, you know, people might say they like the new Mad Max. Yes, obviously, it's a visual treat, and George Miller is incredible no matter what, but there's something about this film. It's so visceral. You know why? Because it's real. All the stunts are real, and they're the most incredible stunts you'll ever see. I don't even know how they did this. I, I am still amazed by the scope of this film, the scale of this film. <laughs> There was no CGI. They couldn't clean anything up. I mean, this was, this is uh, one of the most exciting for me. I can keep, this is a rewatch that I can do all the time because it's just an incredibly visceral, exciting experience when you're watching this film. And, uh, and also, I love Tom Hardy, but Mad Max is Mel Gibson. Come on, let's just, <laughs> let's just admit that. Robocop was my introduction to Verhoeven in high school. Then, of course, I, I started, you know, looking back at his earlier work. But this is this film had such a uh, an impact on me. I mean, I thought I was going to NYU to hopefully make films like yeah. RoboCop. And again, you know, his social satire, his approach to violence and sexuality. It was so different from all the other Hollywood mainstream action films that I was seeing at the time. And then I re realized, oh, it's a foreign director. That's why. There's, some, there's a different sensibility, a different approach. And it really guided me in many ways, I mean, to the to humor as well, like knowing that you can put in some, you know, scathing, biting humor into your stuff. So I... Uh, if you haven't seen this, and I don't know how you could not have seen this, but I highly suggest checking it out. These days, our action is just delivered through uh, through Marvel and through uh, oh yes, this stuff and uh, <laughs> and uh, Fast and the Furious. Yeah. And uh, that's the one thing about the Fast and the Furious uh, series that uh, when they actually add the humor in there, I appreciate it more. When it's Jason mm. Statham in The Rock. That's when I'm starting to even appreciate it more. And it's one thing I think is lacking from present day action fare. Treating the audience respectfully. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like it, all of the action scenes are incredible to watch, but then every scene between those action scenes, you're just like, what is happening right now? <laughs> Sorry. So I guess you're not a big fan of Christopher Nolan because his movies have not a lot of humor. 
but there's a difference there because his 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 craft is on another level and to tell and so actually to tell you the truth i i found tenant to be the film of last year or what 2020 i th- yeah. i felt that tenant was uh so underrated um i think people should go back and really study that film because there are moments that are just in jaw dropping you know the scene where they're in between the glass where yeah. uh brana has her uh and they're observing from the others. I can't even explain the scene. And there is two times. But I, if you watch that scene, it is it is masterful. I think we would have to sit down with Nolan and he would have to explain to us. But it doesn't matter because it has, for me, it worked on a, a whole other level of just this, again, this yeah. visceral excitement that, and the craft level just being so, and the practical. The, I love the, that Nolan does practical uh, effects yeah. and stunts. If I ever get the chance to even do an action set piece i will look to nolan how to do it i don't i don't like the cgi stuff i don't care about that of course for cleanup but not for so if you want yeah. to crash a plane you like crash a plane. <laughs> you crash a plane <laughs> yeah. i consider it one of the best comedies of all time i i really do okay. i i found i find the writing to be incredibly witty i love kurt russell in this film and i think you can kind of see he's an anti-hero and you can kind of see that influence especially on red rocket where it's like he's just a liar through the whole thing but it's okay because he's charming hey morning roy <laughs> same to you asshole we all love where Kurt Russell went with Carpenter, okay? That's, we all love that. But I, one thing, I just wish he also did more comedy because hmm. he shows that he is an incredibly skilled comedic actor. Um, his del- I can just, I think about lines now and his delivery and, and just, uh, and also the supporting cast. Um, it's, it's just a great cast and it's the Mechus. So it's also quite um, competent. I mean, it's like, it's, it's solid directing. And I, I don't know if many people know, but this is like produced by Spielberg. I didn't have Evil Dead on my list, but I love Evil Dead. I think Evil Dead is an incredible, one of the most raw, truly frightening horror films. Eight of spades, two of spades, jack of diamonds, jack of clubs. As a director, I don't get frightened with horror films anymore, which is sad because I know the mechanics, you know, it's like, it's hard for me to be removed anymore and really like get take, uh, swept away. But this one still gets me frightened. I mean, if I watch this alone in a dark with all the lights off, uh, yeah, I would, I would be a little nervous. Oh, River's Edge. Um, saw this in high school and it really um imagine being in high school when all the john hughes films were coming out and you were used to one sort of high school movie and then you see yeah well this is you see this one year and then you see this the next year and you can imagine the sort of impact this had the reality of this and the the approach to this subject matter that is just was also making a comment on the 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 what the the apathy of, of, of youth, especially U.S. youth at that time. Mm. Uh, so this is a gorgeous, it's Keanu Reeves' best role. I don't care what, how in love you are with, with Matrix and uh, mm. what's the new one? The, oh, John, John Wick. Wick yeah. yeah, okay, good, fine. But <laughs> this is where he shines. This is the one he shines in. What the hell was going on in your head, man, huh? Exactly what? What were you thinking about? Or were you even thinking at the time? Answer me, God damn it! I don't know, okay? You want me to make something up? You know, it's so, it felt so real. It felt like I was hanging out with my teenage friends. Um, and to, t- to tell you the truth, to this day, I haven't seen a U.S. film that has truly captured youth this, um, this accurately hmm. and realistically. It's hard. Uh, John Hughes, one day I'll say, this is my favorite. The next day I'll say 16 Candles is yeah. my favorite. Yeah, I consider him one of the, the best, or just like the most um, important US filmmakers ever because of his of the impact he's had on, on popular culture. Into Dawn of the Dead that I had, um, so I have a, my father's side of the family is from Western Pennsylvania. During the summers, we would have family reunions. So 
of course, instead of like <laughs> being at the family reunion, I would say, dad, we have to go to the Monroeville mall. Take me to the Monroeville mall. And I would go to the Monroeville mall with my VHS camera. I would just shoot all of the spaces within the mall that I recognized. And this was like 20 years after the, no, not 20 years, 78 mid eighties. So it wasn't that long after. And, uh, but I remember the skating ring had been gone and I was like looking for it and, <laughs> and I went home and then I would edit it and put zombie music or no goblin music. I'm sorry, goblin music on top of my stupid little VHS thing. And, and then I went to the graveyard of from night of the living dead. That's in Butler County. And you were a huge fan of Romero at the time. Oh my God. I'm still a yeah. huge fan of Romero. <laughs> and, uh, I have a, uh, a one sheet pristine dawn of the dead poster on my wall. I consider this one of the most just, yeah, actually I, I'm saying this is one of the best films ever made. I mean, it's like uh, the, his, his everything to do with this from a technical level to just, to, just to his approach to the, to, um, again, uh, social commentary with humor mm -hmm. and race and, uh, just, just so much going on in this, um, an incredible film. <laughs> Oh, God, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you have this. I'm glad it's here. When people ask you, like, what are your favorite films ever, you usually lean towards, you know, the prestige films, yeah. the, the ones that are already celebrated, the ones that are considered top 100 films and ones you should study as a filmmaker. But then there are films that are just, you have to just say, and I don't mean to say it's so bad, it's good, but there are films that um, <laughs> work on in a different way than probably what the filmmakers intended. But it's brilliant still. And this film, there are many like this. Some people go, to, if you want a so bad, it's good movie. Uh, you can go towards Ed Wood. You can go towards Tommy Wiseau's The Room. Yeah. I go to this one. I just actually rewatched this film at Tarantino's theater, the New Bev in LA, and laughed for literally so hard that my, you know, my, my, my ribs hurt. I laughed for two, an hour and a half straight. This is an incredibly funny film on every every shot, every frame has something wrong with it in a gorgeous, in a beautiful way. And the music is actually really great too. I mean, I can actually, I. Re I can actually whistle it right now if I needed to. I mean, it's actually catchy tunes. So um, I, I don't know if you know what this film's about, but it's about <laughs> <laughs> it's about a Taekwondo martial arts rock band that has to fight a motorcycle gang made of ninjas uh, who are selling drugs in Miami. It's it's just an incredible movie. I highly recommend it. But it's not a comedy at first. It's like a very no, serious No, it's tried story. to be a martial arts film back in the day. <laughs> and it got rediscovered. I don't know if, it, if you know this, but it was, it was made in 86. I believe it was made in 86. It was made in 86, but it wasn't really brought out into the world until, I believe, 2010 or 12 by okay. Draft House. And it, since then, it's become in, like an instantaneous cult hit. This defines cult hit for me. I'm a big Cassavetes fan. He speaks to me on many levels, not just his approach to, you know, to uh, the human condition and uh, the way that he, he approaches, uh, you know, human interactions and his approach to dialogue and behavior, stuff that wasn't being done before he was doing it. Um, Husbands happens to be my favorite of his, and I, I'm not sure why. I think I just, there's that, that scene around the, uh, the table, the dinner table, where three men start to mock the women, but there was something about the way that they interacted, and I recognize that. I recognize that male mm. interaction that, um, that's just so real. Um, stuff that we kind of are shy to show these days. All right, now a drink. Here's to Joel. Joe. 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 Cassavetti, just his approach, the way he did, just his independence, um, I feel has had a major impact on me. The way that, you know, he made a film with a small family, a small intimate family of filmmakers. And uh, that's what I'm trying to do with my films. I find it to be the most satisfying. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, the Dardens. They, obviously, I, I love the Dardens. I couldn't even tell you which is my favorite. Um, They're probably Rosetta. Pourquoi tu plantes tous ces trucs? On va quand même pas rester ici, hein?
Rosetta having that ending where it's just so heartbreaking, where she can't, I'm spoiling it, sorry, where she can't commit suicide. It's just one of the most, it tears you up inside. It just absolutely tears you up. And then their, their style obviously also spoke to me in the way that the Dogma 95 film spoke to me because it allowed me to, you know, uh, again, to, to, to shoot in this docu style, which is a craft in, into its, unto itself, but it's also a way to truly just allow the actors to act and, and for those, for those real moments to play out in real time, which I think is so important for, uh, for developing characters character and, uh, and having the audience really, really lose themselves in uh, the fake reality of film. It was great to also, you know, I try to watch, um, I still, to this day, uh, I don't want to be, just be studying older films. Um, so the Dardens uh, came about in, what was it, late 90s, early knots, right? Mm. And, and, um, and I was, I was happy to see that contemporary films were still influencing and inspiring me. And that's why to this day, you know, I still, I, I, I absorb as much as possible of new cinema because I, I want to see where things are going and how things are progressing. And uh, I never understood when filmmakers say, oh yeah, I'm, I don't watch contemporary movies. I, I don't watch anything past 1978. I'm like, why? why? There's been a lot of you know, a lot of incredible innovation since 78. Um, but yeah, that's just my So you rant. see a lot of movies in a way. Oh, I... Like well, daily. Daily. Daily? Yeah. Daily. <laughs> I traveled to Paris with my Blu-ray player. No joke. <laughs> Maurice uh, Pallot obviously is like, you know, you're the French Cassavetes. And I discovered him a little late, I would say. Yeah. Uh, just again, because of exposure to world cinema. Anua Moore is my favorite. I just love the interactions. I love the physicality. I love during Tangerine. I was like, I gave my actors that film and I said, I'm sorry, you're going to have to be as slapped as hard as some of these actors are slapped in this film. <laughs> and not, not, to, not to fake it, you mean? Yeah, not make it. Because he never faked it. Yeah. And I have a funny little story. Um, the American in that film who was a little teenager at the time yeah. is my like 60 year old neighbor in New York city. And he came up to me one day cause he realized I was a filmmaker mm. and he goes, I hear you're a filmmaker. You have a film in theaters. I'm like, yeah, yeah. This is way back starlet or Prince of Broadway or something. And he said, uh, I was in a film once and I said, what film? And he's like, Oh, it's a French film. I'm like, tell me more, <laughs> tell me more. <laughs> and then he said, do you know, uh, Maurice Pallat? I'm like, what? What are you talking about? And then I saw him and I saw, I saw the 60 year old version of this teenager. And I'm just like, do you understand that you're like in a classic movie? Do you understand this? Christiana F. Okay. So I, back when I was in, at NYU, there was a uh, public access television in New York city. There was one show where it was just a, a montage of just almost shocking clips, random without any credit. And I remember seeing this scene where the two teens are um, withdrawing from heroin and vomiting everywhere. And I'm just like, what the f What is this movie? Like, where is this image coming from? Because it's, it's, it's imp quite impactful. It took me like five years to realize that it's from Christiana F. Well, this movie speaks to me on many levels. I mean, first off, I find it to be incredibly, it's just gorgeously shot. This is the type of cinematography I go for when I make my films. That heavy green fluorescent glow in those subways and just the reality of this. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I can't, I have probably about, and I'm not joking here, probably between 20 and 25 different posters of Christian F from all over the world. Eric Romer uh, and uh, Claire Zini. The reason I bring this one up um, it's kind of weird too, because you guys asked me to put together a list yeah. and I realized that, oh, wow, I, I never even kind of made the connection between this film and Red Rocket and, you know, the obsession of an older man with a younger woman. I never made that connection until today when I put together this. But this, the reason I, 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 I added this film to the list is because it was my introduction, my formal introduction to uh, French New Wave. 
<laughs> of course, growing up, we've all heard, you know, we, we knew Truffaut. No matter how isolated you were in New, the New Jersey suburbs, you heard Truffaut, Godard. But this film was, I think I found this by accident. I saw this image on a VHS box and I was intrigued. I loved the colors. I loved the, the approach, the, the, the you know, the, the dialogue, true human emotion, which I hadn't seen in U.S. cinema. I mean, this was, this is what the new wave had, which was so incredible. And also, I have to say, and I know she's only in two films, but Aurora uh, Cornu, who is a Romanian French writer who I unfortunately just passed away last year, um, she had a big impact on the my 18 year old self. And I don't know why. I think it was a mature woman who had this incredible, you know, uh, presence and intelligence, but also mature sexuality that I was just like, I was actually drawn to her, um, very much so. Uh, so when I think of this film, I don't think of Claire. I, I actually think of Aurora, the writer. Um, yeah, cool. Well, it was great being here and uh, 